good evening and happy Friday. We are coming to you live with episode eight, aka the last ballpark of our weekly album discussion streams. I'm Matt, and tonight I'm joined by Cam. Hello. And we've got Brad here tonight as well. Hello. Together we are Ballpark Music, and every week we pick an album that came out on a Friday, give ourselves a week with it, then come back together on a stream for an in-depth discussion. No scoring, no taste making, because music is not sports. If you like what you see, give us a follow on the socials, and we'll let you know when we're going live. Yeah, welcome back, Brad. Welcome back. I see Cam's one-man social media campaign hashtag, where is Brad, paid off. Uh, how, how was your week? This week? Yeah, not too bad, man. <laughs> not too bad at all, comparatively. I mean, I don't know why you didn't let me in last week. You just left me in the <laughs> well, You got kidnapped, week. man. That's what happened. <laughs> I think That's we were going to take and style mission to get him back. Yeah, we yeah. were we were half expecting you to be in the chat, just you know, sending us coordinates or things <laughs> like that, right? You know, only way we could track you down. Yeah, uh, Cam, how how was uh, how was yours? Uh, how, and I think secondly, how does it feel to be an artist that released a fucking album? It feels pretty good, but you know, ain't much, but it's honest work. Um, yeah. Finally, I don't have to listen to it ever again. You have to listen to it now. So <laughs> that feels pretty great. <laughs> uh, shout out Dreadlocks777. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Uh, chiming in with the hashtag, they found Brad. Uh, but guys, uh, before we get too far into it, I've got the all important question for you. What are you drinking tonight? Brad, you go first on this one because I've got a bit of a, a bit of a thing. Okay, well, I've gone back to my roots and I've got the Bunk IPA again. I, I, I don't have anti-establishment IPA. Uh, one, once again, I have failed. Um, instead, you know, just, just to tip our hat a little bit towards, you know, who we're, who we're, who we're talking about tonight, I, I've got myself a little French beer, a Cronenberg, which I haven't Classy. had since, like, uni or something like that and i guess i think of the football man who kicked the football fan uh, no. that's the one yeah yeah so i saw a thing on the internet earlier that told me if you mix corona and cranberry juice together it tastes like cherry bakewells so i thought i'd do it live it's like a kind of live science experiment and see how it tastes and see you know if i've um made a huge mistake or not i do you know the ratio <laughs> i'm just you know i'm just gonna free ball it dude i don't need ratios this is like making lean you don't like measure out lean dude you just eyeball it this is now twice in the last 10 minutes that lean has come up in this conversation um I, I i think it's generally speaking a bad sign as well as soon as you say oh i'm gonna start mixing drinks together and then like electrical interference comes through on the stream like there's some bad juju that you're messing about with there man i don't know it just takes me back to being like you know 18 when you just you've got like that big pile of drinks and you all mix all of your drinks together and then drink it i figured it'd be like a situation like that so i'm gonna try it it's got a big big head on it we can say that much it's pretty good okay wait no nope. second taste is not good <laughs> it's bad it's bad but yeah is it bad like cool. a cherry bakewell though because again the question wasn't whether it's good the question was whether uh it was uh tasting like a cherry bakewell um it it, it kind of tastes like cranberry juice that someone's messed with <laughs> in some sort of way i don't really know how else to describe it i'm really do you actually, right now do you actually like cherry bakewells did you consider that before yeah, man, i love cherry bakewells that's why okay. you know i trusted the stranger on the internet reel on the on the instagrams you know being sensible never trust somebody on instagram who says you should put corona in your body like full stop i guess you know that, that would probably be sound advice i like it man minute. what's not to like corona good that corona good not other corona <laughs> cranberry juice good it's all good to me man 
and hey, you know, whatever's happening, cranberry juice makes your body healthy. So, you know, you're 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 doing a net benefit right now. Net benefit. Isn't that only if you have pee problems? Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to dox you and your pee problems. Were they not public knowledge? <laughs> it's on the record now. Isn't it? <laughs> Now, uh, look, we are chomping at the bit to, well, I mean, are we? We, we were talking about an, a little idea, a little starter for 10 before uh, we went live. And I, I don't feel like we ever came to a decision whether we were going for that or not. Do, do we want to go for this? Uh, I'm thinking not, because the more I think about it, the more I actually don't know what <laughs> album I would pick. So even though I suggested this whole thing, I haven't actually thought about what record it would be, so... Maybe next week, yeah. I tell you what, tune in next week and you'll see the starter for 10 that we were talking about. Um, I'll look forward to it then. But uh, yeah, like I say, we are chomping at the bit to get straight into our album review tonight. But uh, yeah, look, I mean, this has been just slightly a bizarrely emotional week over in my household. Um, uh, we spoke about this. I mean, do you guys mind if I just take a minute to say something real quick here? Um, yeah, go for it, man. Now, we're three guys who came together primarily through a shared love of music, um, but we have a number of other shared interests, right? You know, it probably won't surprise you, not least because we're streaming this on Twitch, that one of those things is video games. Um, and speaking for myself, a great amount of engagement has been through a website about video games called giantbomb.com. Uh there was a pretty earth-shaking, out-of-the-blue announcement uh, that three of the mainstays of that site uh, would be leaving at the end of this week, uh, Alex Navarro, Vinny Caravella, and Brad Shoemaker. And those names might not mean a great deal to many of you, um, but honestly, if it wasn't for that site, if it wasn't for those guys, this stream right now wouldn't be happening. Um, everything that I have learned so far about streaming, podcasting, hosting a thing on the internet has been through being a fan of their work for years and years. Um, everything about how this show is set up, how we go through topics, to how even looking around we've set things up graphically, right, have been at some level inspired by Giant Bomb. Twice a week, every week, I listen to Brad and Vinny host two of the best podcasts in the universe, learn how to thoughtfully guide a show through topics they were deeply passionate about while giving everybody a voice and space and handle emotionally charged subjects with unparalleled compassion and care. Um, I still have a hell of a lot to learn and I'm grateful that there is an endless back catalog of content to go back through. Um, and just to get us back on a music related note very quickly here, Alex is an incredibly talented drummer as proven in his marathon rock band uh, streams. And I implore all of you to check out his band, None, of, uh, None Above All. If you like New York hardcore, you'll love it. Brad and Vinny, equally talented musicians. You can find a cover that they did of More Than Words on YouTube and it's just fantastic. They don't call him Brad, voice of an angel shoemaker for nothing. I'll miss hearing them every week, but Alex, Brad, and Vinny, if you ever come across this, uh, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done. And cheers to all of you. Cheers to the future and cheers to Giant Bomb. I didn't know you were going to do a toast, otherwise I would have drank, but. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise toast. Mm. Surprise toast. They sneak up you got on warm you. people, man. you got warm people. Is it, did I say Brad voice of an angel? It sounds like there's a space for a new Brad voice of an angel, man. <laughs> do I sing now? Do I out myself on stream singing? Do it. I've never heard you sing. I've always wanted to. We'll save, we'll save that one for a future episode. Okay. <laughs> Another reveal. Another hashtag Brad reveal. Uh, you know, we didn't have to wait till episode 100 for the last one. I'm sure we won't have to wait till uh, episode 100 for this one. Um, anyway. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Uh, with that out of the way, I, I think it's about time for some fucking metal. Um, what do you guys say? Uh, always. Always. So, that's right. This week, we've got Gojira's Fortitude up at the plate, uh, just appearing on screen there. Um, and yeah, I think we're all a little bit excited for this one. Um, this group chat's been buzzing away during the week. Uh, I've got an excerpt from... 
uh, the band's statement um, that they put out about this album, uh, just to help set us the scene here. Uh, so this came out on Roadrunner Records. Uh, Gojira tends to operate in polar extremes. Quote, I can't help but see humanity as a parasite, Gojira's co-founding guitarist and principal songwriter Joe Duplantier explains, and yet the most beautiful things come out of humans. To that end, the French quartet, Duplantier and his brother Mario, Christian Andrew, and Jean-Michel Labadie, I've butchered all of that. I apologize to the nation of France. Uh, have spent the past 15 years translating this quality into a distinctive sound. Dark, crushing metal brightened by triumphant arena rock melodies, contrast heavy and emotionally charged. Following the crossover success of their Grammy-nominated 2016 album, Magma, Gojira made a group decision. For album number seven, Fortitude, they'd have some damn fun. In late 2019, the brothers returned to uh, returned to Silver Chord Studio, their Ridgewood Queens headquarters, to begin work on new self-produced Go Gojira material, culled from ideas they developed over the past two years. Of course, 2020 had other plans, just as Fortitude was nearing completion, halfway through the mixing process to be exact, COVID-19 hit, bringing Gojira along with the rest of the world to an abrupt halt. While waiting out the lockdown back home in France with his family, Joe re-examined the songs from a post-pandemic perspective. Not only did they fit the turmoil of the time, in hindsight, they were downright prophetic. To be clear, Fortitude isn't intended as a musical escape hatch from all this unending global misery. Actually, it's the opposite. A series of searing motivational speeches urging humanity to imagine a new world and then make it happen. So, Cam, a few weeks back, you and I had a conversation where we were trying to chart out the albums we'd be discussing in the forthcoming weeks, right? There were a few weeks where we had a few things to choose from or were really looking to try and find something that would fit. But when it came to the 6th of May, there was absolutely no question about what we were covering, right? I've had this on pre-order for about three months. So <laughs> before we even started streaming, I, I knew that, you know, in some capacity, I wanted to talk about this, whether it was writing or, or whatever. Um, huge Gajira fan. And uh, this week's been quite hard for me to, you know, write some objective notes about what I'm hearing and not fanboy over it. Uh, and Brad, I mean, talk to me. Have you, have you had any contact with Gojira before? Any idea of what to expect? Yes, I have a, a little bit, um, kind of a band that various friends have been interested in and kind of circles of people that I know have always listened to them. It's never something that's particularly grabbed me from their previous work, um, but I have been aware of them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as you here, right? You know, I, I, I've been aware of Gojira for a while in the same way that I am aware of, say, the political goings-on of Australia. Like, I know that they exist. I know that they're very interesting, but my knowledge pretty much begins and ends there. Um, and a little more generally, I think, you know, metal has never been one of my favorite genres of music. It, it's one of those that, you know, I enjoy when it's on, but I don't really have a great deal of affinity one way or another for many metal bands, you know, particularly those that have a level of mainstream appeal, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, what, what I will say is that I, I always tend to stick on Daniel P. Carter's Radio 1 Rock Show most weeks while I'm working. And as a result of that, I've heard a lot of Gojira in 2021, caught up on all of the singles uh, when they were released. And I, I, I must say my interest was well and truly peaked. So, you know, again, I have been looking forward to this one as well. Definitely been looking forward to it. Yeah, massively. So there's been a huge single campaign for them. I think they like half of the album has been released as singles at various points. I, I think I heard another world for the first time possibly last year um i really can't remember now it's been a huge build up to it so and i have totally missed all of it <laughs> you to get out in the world a bit more brad <laughs> i don't know that's <laughs> next year really oh well, yeah year. right fair enough <laughs> 
it's kind of an interesting one. I think we'll hit a point later on in the uh, album where we'll we'll talk about yeah whether coming to a single um, outside of the context of an album is a good thing. But uh, yeah, um, it was a lengthy PR campaign that they had for this one. I think part of that is down to you know the unique way that we uh, ended up uh, spending last year um, was supposed to be released a little bit earlier, got delayed. So they just ended up dragging out the PR campaign for, I, I, I'm sure I saw somebody mention that it had been like a solid year of PR for this album. Uh, but hey, should we uh, take a look, see if that level of hype was uh, worth it? What do we say? Go for it. Fantastic. So we'll get into the track by track here. Uh, we kick off with Born for One Thing, which was coincidentally one of the first singles from this album uh cam yeah do you want to kick us off on this yeah man i mean there's a real easy point to start there's just that huge pumping chaotic natural harmonic kind of style um intro with that really pumping bass it just, just keeps stabbing you in the face while it's, while it's happening and just snare roll giving it all that drive and then it goes into that just huge ferocious riff and it's groovy and it's heavy and I try, I try to be objective, but it's just so damn good. <laughs> Honestly, it's insane how groovy that riff is. And whether you want to or not, you are compelled to bang your head. Like, I, I don't have the hair for it anymore. It's been a long time since those days. Um, and I think I speak for everyone <laughs> here, actually, on that point. But there is, there, I defy anyone to listen to that and not even just have a little wobble going on kind of thing um the, the drums are absolutely incredible they're huge um mario um is an absolutely incredible drummer um and i just i love the dynamics in this song because you've got this crazy chaotic verse and then it, it drops into the chorus and it slows down it calms down it becomes anthemic and it's like it just a, it's a it's a kind of role reversal of what usually happens in that kind of loud soft dynamic and, and they just do it so masterfully that you you almost don't notice it happens at first, and you're just into this huge chorus. Uh, it's just really good. <laughs> really good. So I think, you know, worth saying, um, uh, going back to one of the interviews that I heard with uh, Joe, uh, he spoke about how they kept the formula or the template for this album. Um, uh, for pretty much every song, there's a few here and there that change up a little bit. Very simple, right? You know, they wanted to stick with just two guitars, one bass, drums, and vocals. And man, with this track, if they don't show what they can do with that straight from the off, right? Um, it's it's that almost stereotypical like hype start so uh start to the uh song and the album between the guitar and the snare. You then sweep into the vocals, wonderfully heavy riff. Um, yeah, straight in your face from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, this kind of kicks us off. Like, this song kind of starts to describe what the album is going to be about. Um, you just straight in, like, they're showing their kind of prog chops. You've got some, like, polyrhythms going on between the, the drums and the bass. Uh, it's like a kind of six over four thing. Um, some of their more death metal -y roots coming through like big pinch harmonics the natural harmonics like you already said um another kind of driving force on this album is how locked in like the guitar the bass and drums are and it's like obviously apparent straight away on this um you kind of start to get a feel for some of the textures that they're gonna like throw at you throughout this as well um kind of big thick kind of harmonies whether it's like with the vocals or like spacious guitars uh, reverbs and things like that going on and um plenty of chugging as well it's really interesting that you um you know you say that about introducing kind of the the themes or the concepts of the album right because uh really i thought that it was a little bit um interesting that we've spent so much time over the last few weeks when we've uh been listening to the opening tracks on albums talking about how bands are trying to very carefully introduce themes you know be they lyrically or musically that are going to permeate throughout the rest of the album but i i, I didn't feel so much of that with this track right you know it, it, it it's it speaks volumes i think to 
you know having talented musicians that are keeping it simple and um and uh you know you stick to that template that joe spoke about keep things interesting for 11 songs then you can go just balls out to open the whole thing up like they do here so there's, there's a couple of things i'll say on that is one i don't believe them when they say they kept it simple because rhythmically like brad's alluded to there is a lot going on here it's it, it it doesn't always sound like it but there's you know polyrhythms going on and there's all this crazy stuff that you, you basically have to have a physics degree to be able to work out that kind of stuff um or just be brad <laughs> and so there's that but i also think in terms of introducing themes there's there's not only the the rhythmic kind of aspect of gojira that they'll they'll keep going throughout but lyrically as well they start to introduce the themes here um and and there's a there's a lot of introduction going on with this song maybe not in tonality wise i kind of get that that side of what you're saying there um because there are huge shifts in styles tone you know we have a kind of sludge metal outro here that i haven't heard since 2010 <laughs> and you know that doesn't really appear that frequently on on the rest of the album um but yeah and in, in terms of like uh sort of technical aspects and lyrical themes there, there's some there's some huge kind of things here. there's one lyric i don't know if it, if any of the others that caught uh your eye and it's obviously the main one from the chorus for me and it's like we were born for one thing born to face the greatest fear of them all and uh, obviously they're talking about humanity and the fear of death and, and all that kind of thing and like you were saying in the beginning it's prof prophetic um these kind of things that they'd written about before this whole thing had even happened um, and you just get this sense that it's all going to be about the journey of humans um, from from right from the off, and that never really never really tapers off. Um, you know, I'd written down about that same "the greatest fear of all" lyric um, that appeared there. Right, you know, mostly I think I'd noted that one down because um, you've got a real wonderful waterfall of those choral like backing vocals um on the odd line throughout the song that's one of them um and that's something that i really enjoy on this album and we're gonna get a heck of a lot more of um it just gives so much texture to the track in all the right places and establishes how much space they have to play about with but you know like you say these lyrics are delivering all throughout this song an anti-consumerist message uh inspired by tibetan and thai philosophers but they keep it very easy to understand right you know remember gazing up for answers but now we're staring down um but it all remains very thoughtful still yeah I, if you look back a couple of weeks when we were doing spirit of the beehive we kind of had entertainment death and it was kind of a gradual build from one to the other and uh Gujira a bit more on the nose and <laughs> just straight to the point with this one it's like first song death and it's like yeah okay cool um yeah um I also there is no entertainment before <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i also kind of noticed that outro like of a classic like china breakdown like just China smashing through in your face, and it's like, wow, that's a good sound that I've not heard for a long time. Yeah, big annotations of an autopsy vibes, right? <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> Names that you haven't heard in in fifteen years, almost, or ever, even in my case, that's a new one. Uh, you, you weren't part of the the Swindon deathcore scene. <laughs> I wasn't. People can accuse me of a lot of things, but they cannot accuse me of being part of the Swindon death course scene. For better yeah. or worse. <laughs> you were one of those three people. No, no, come on. There was more than that. It was a big thing for, for a couple of minutes. Shout out. This is Water in Chat uh, coming in and keeping us honest. Just joined. Has Cam mentioned Sonic Youth yet? Not yet. Not yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Uh, we've got a few more tracks to go. And I tell you what, let's move on to the second one here uh amazonia um and yeah i mean you know serves me right for extolling the virtues of keeping everything straightforward and sticking to a template and talking about how gojira did that for us to be welcomed onto amazonia by traditional indigenous folk instruments um brad do you think you can help me out here <laughs> okay so i'm not too sure how indigenous it is but like the main thing i picked up on this intro was what sounds to me like a mouth harp or a jaw harp um that kind of twangy and nasally sound coming through and it kind of took me down a bit of a weird rabbit hole to be perfectly honest but i was like wow i really need to look up like 
how the jewel harp is actually like played. <laughs> so, like, and how far down this rabbit hole did you get? Please share well, with the class. This is where it gets weird, all right? <laughs> so I, went, I go onto YouTube and there's a whole channel, this guy called Bebcorp Harpery, <laughs> and he's got a whole channel dedicated to mouth harps from what I can tell. And um, in the first video that I clicked on, he's wearing a Mastodon t shirt. <laughs> And obviously, I think these guys are on the same label. And I was like, is there like some deep connection here that I'm not seeing? <laughs> like, this, this guy who runs this mouth harp channel in a Mastodon t shirt, like, obviously, they've toured with Gojira and, you know. You quite, do think of them in the of, same breath. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a bit of a bomb there. Um, so, yeah, mouth harp, not quite what I was expecting, but I mean, it works. Can I just um, ask, Brad, is the mouth harp that weird didgeridoo sound thing? <laughs> yeah, it like a didgeridoo. I thought it was a didgeridoo. <laughs> so I, I think we can just, uh, you know, dive on a little bit of that uh, straight from the off, right? And, you know, it's it's worth mentioning that this is a great example of music and lyrics working together in perfect harmony to convey um, meaning or message. Um, the folk instruments the mouth harp uh the didgeridoo like thing right um they are uh omnipresent throughout this track um certainly not like the main focus of the whole song but they are pretty consistently there right um the lyrics meanwhile are lamenting human races mindless destruction of the amazon rainforest in particular um you know, all the beauty, all the might, all the life-giving power that it maintains with it just for the sake of, again, consumption, um, forest and logging, uh, forest uh, fires. That should have said fires. Fires and logging get some fairly opaque mentions, um, as does illegal gold mining, which happens in the area to the detriment of those indigenous peoples uh, who call the rainforest their home. Um, and really worth pointing out that the band have backed uh, this track up with action. Um, all proceeds uh, from Amazonia, again, it was another single, uh, benefit the Gurani and Kiowa tribes. Um, and, you know, we keenly advocate supporting artists here at Ballpark Music. And though we would never tell you directly to go out and purchase a track, I think we can all agree that that is a cause worth supporting. Um, and yeah, Cam, is it a track worth supporting aside from that message anyway? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> There's something that immediately hit me and I haven't looked this up yet to confirm it, but I'm 99% sure that these guys are massive Sepultura fans because there's no way that you can write a track like this without being a giant Sepultura fan. It could have been on roots it really could have with that kind of you know tribal instrumentation for lack of a better word for it or um you know um native instruments i mean i think we've established that it's not actually kind of south american instrumentation possibly i, I don't know where the mouth harps from but uh yeah i mean this it's just an absolute huge there's this just that just really disgusting verse and there's no other way i can describe it because it's so heavy and it just kind of makes you pull that face where you're like, so good. I've tried really hard not to fanboy, but it's, it's hard, man. We're it's on track two, this. man. You got a long way to go. It's hard when it's this good. Like, this is just a band at the absolute peak of what they do. Um, just pulling it through and just able to do whatever they want. There's so much groove. There's so much movement. There's all of these textures, as Brad's talked about, and it's just it's just pack packaged in a way I don't think I've heard a band do in like 20 or 30 years. You know, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And as you've touched on behind it as well, and this is something I often fall off with, with metal is great lyrical content. Um, you know, real lyrical content about things they care about that are important. And, you know, you, you don't often get that with a kind of, sludge death metal band you know or what i mean i couldn't categorize gajira into one type of metal at this point but you just don't often get that kind of thing and it's just oh, it's, it's just good it's all around it's just good 
I think that Sepultura um, influence uh, something that I've, I've seen mentioned around um, in some other commentary. Um, again, not a band whose music uh, I have had much, if any, engagement with really uh, off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, um, I think something that uh, from, from what I gather reading around it, a lot of influence uh, through uh, to this music as well. Uh, Brad, you got anything else on Amazonia? No, um, just like, again, it's another like really good example of their kind of blend between those like super like heavy kind of chuggy riffs and like the gear change between those like big kind of open spaces, like vocal passages, um, those kind of driving harmonies and things that just sound really good. Brilliant. Right. So we're on to another world. Um, and yeah, so I thought that this was one of the singles from the album, um, but I checked their distribution and everything. It doesn't look like it was actually officially released as a single on some platforms, at least. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, this track did receive some significant airtime um, on radio stations beforehand and stuff like that. So I, I made I thought this was the lead single. Uh, first one that came out was, um, uh, it was Born for One Thing. Um, so this one's got a video and everything. I heard this, first time I heard this was actually on Daniel P. Carter's show. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. This, this came out a long time ago. This is one of the one I think I heard last it year. It was February. Uh, oh, maybe you might be right, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, like you say, first time I heard this was on the Radio One Rock show. Um, and one thing I wanted to just talk about very quickly just uh as a pricey to this song was um you know my uh was uh an interesting discussion between daniel p carter and joe about the lyrical content of this track and you know it, it comes back to something that you were talking about um uh just there cam as well um you know joe described another world as the band's opportunity to have what he described as a tantrum right we, we've already spoken about their social and particularly ecological conscience um, and how they're usually like solution led as uh, evidenced on Amazonia. But they used another world as their opportunity to allow all of their frustrations to boil over and essentially say, you know, another world, I'm out of here. Um, in the same interview, he tackled head on some criticism uh, that they have had in the past about their ly lyrics being simplistic and they often get daubed in comment sections as, uh, as childish. Uh, but he spoke about how they like to keep and uh, try and keep it simple without being overly simplistic and how proud he is of the writing um, in, on this album in particular. Um, and also quite rightly pointed out that, you know, he is writing in a language um, that is not his first language, right? Um, and I, I, I think all around an incredibly impressive feat. I, I, I can't believe anyone would criticize him lyrically other than, you know, logging lobby. You know, <laughs> um, those kind of people. I, I just have to say about this, oh, it's... I, I it's almost i can't get the words out how i feel about this song it's so rare that a metal song can invoke such strong emotions um but Gajira have captured the zeitgeist in such a resonant way here um i think over the last year we've all had these feelings that the end of humanity is nigh and we just love to start over run away and that cry of another world in the chorus is it does something physically to me and i can't explain it it makes me want to run it makes me want to just freak out and go crazy uh, i it's so rare to experience that in music um and and it's just it's the i mean there's so much more you could talk about with this song it's like incredible riff that you know that really grooving riff that goes all the way throughout the song i almost sung it but i won't <laughs> i can see brad laughing because he does the same thing no doubt but yeah that that cry of another world in the chorus is i mean that could be the album on a loop for me for, for an hour and that would be fine um it's incredible it really i was wondering how long it would be before the sound effects started coming out <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, 
I've not heard the criticism that you mentioned, but this is definitely better lyrically than any album I've ever written in French. So, um, <laughs> speak for yourself, like... dude. I'm like, do fromage. <laughs> Oh boy. Next to Lent. <laughs> French is the language of love. Anyway, let's move on before this descends. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so that like that riff, that opening riff, um, I'm not gonna sing it. As tempting as it is, but it is like it just grooves, like you've got the drums, keeping it simple, like something about this band is I feel like you listen to them and you immediately know that they've got a lot of experience behind them. There's no way you could like think that this is a band that's just formed um, how much they're locked in, how much like they know when to let someone take the spotlight or let one element take the spotlight and kind of lay back a bit. And when they know, like it's obvious when they know that like, okay, this is your part. This is where you do the crazy shit. Um, the vocals again, like love the vocal backing, the blend on the vocals, um, snare sound in this <laughs> this whole album. The snare sound is like awesome, man. It's just like super on point. Um, and you kind of start to get like I've heard it a few times throughout this album. I think, but you get like some kind of interesting pitch shifting effects going on with the guitar. Mm. Um, something that gets kind of brought back a lot. I don't know if it's in Gorgia's earlier work. I don't know if it's something that they. A lot. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Magnum's yeah. full of it. Really? I've not. Yeah, I mean, they, they use that. The, the, the two Gajira signatures are pitch shifting and pick scrapes. Right. Okay. If, if you hear those, it's a Gajira song. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, a big theme for them. Um, yeah. I mean, the outro to this, like, really caught my ear as well. It's kind of that, like, got like it's kind of almost like a cowboy film it's kind God. of like, like dark like yeah it's dark kind of guitar like outro it sounds really good Goddamn divine that outro mm. is i loved it um uh made my notes as well um i mean look you know uh, another world is probably the track that i have heard the most off this album um in advance of it coming out uh in most instances, um, when I uh, have that experience with a single before an album comes out, I get to the album and I'm just like, skip it. I've, I've heard it too many times at this point. But no, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Uh, Another World, probably one of my favorites um, on this album. Um, and it, it's an album that's packed full of riffs. Um, like you've both mentioned the one that greets you off the top of it and emanates throughout the track is right up there for me dynamic spot on um and yeah i i, I really do feel like it is gojira unleashed and at their best you know what's incredible about this song though is is actually how heavy it is and I say something quite strange in that it, they're really proving that you don't have to be heavy to be heavy I don't know if anyone feels what I mean by that, but with the groove and the kind of tightness of everything that's been going on, like Brad said, knowing when to let Mario shine, knowing, knowing when to let uh, the bassist, whose name's completely gone out of my head, shine, um, it, it just makes it so much heavier. And the fact that the bass is so prominent in places, again, drives that heaviness. Um, but... Everything just shines. It's, it, the production is immense. Um, it's just got that special revolutionary feeling that you just don't get that often in music. Thanks for making me make, uh, say the bassist's name again, considering it was the one that tripped me up first time round. Let's try it again. Jean-Michel Labadie. I think Should we just go with Jean-Michel? That works too. That works too. But I wanted, <laughs> wanted to make sure you had the whole thing there. Um, right. So, uh, we'll move on to the fourth track. We'll... Uh, also pause here to shout out electric slide on them in the chat thanks for joining us um uh, you've got some lengthy messages there bro so uh it's uh we've got a lot of notes to get through uh apologies uh for not reading through those uh so yeah uh, fourth track hold on um we we slowly fade out of another world uh i think that the first three tracks uh have been pretty full on to this point 
Um, so when you're welcomed to hold on by a choir of vocals, and yes, the sound effects are all coming out now. It's you know, that ah, I've been grinding and grinding for a few lines. Um, it it does act as a bit of a change of pace. Um, yeah, Brad, what have, what have you got for hold on? Yeah, again, this is like another big vocal feature coming in straight away. Um, you can't escape it in this one. Um, again, like really nice blend on it. Um, going back to something you said earlier about them, like keeping it simple and keeping to the template, I think from an instrumentation point of view, they kind of mostly do. <laughs> Maybe Amazonia is the exception that proves the rule. Um, but you do get some kind of synth popping through on that intro as well, and uh, I'm always appreciative of that. Um, it's just kind of an epic build from there. You've got like four on the floor kick, um, epic guitar with that harmony. It just like just lends itself to this like massive build. Um, and grinding is like well, this like the grind is kind of something that's referenced later. Um, more pitch shifting. The thing, the the part, the standout kind of part for this song is kind of comes in around three thirty. It's just like this beautiful riff, um, and like you said, Cameron. Like, I think something that really helps from like in this album is the contrast between the bits that are heavier and the bits that are more melodic, and it's done so well that it never like kind of takes you out of it, but it just kind of blends and works together really well. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. They're, they're so good at it as well. Um, the it, it could be jarring. I think if I tried to do those those massive dynamic changes from you know grooving metal to huge anthemic atmospheric choruses, I would probably fall quite flat on my face. But as we've mentioned, this is this is a pro band. When we started this channel, um. We said no bold statements, no big claims, no taste making, no scoring, yada 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 yada. We're just gonna talk about the album. Ten I'm out gonna of th- ten. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna throw that out of the window right now because uh, uh, Gajira are the best band on the planet right now. I, I genuinely think they might be. Um, they've got to be close because again, you've got another lyrical shift of themes here, and we're stuck in the middle of the ocean, and you're trying to find a way to get back to land and it's talking about this grind and it echoes a theme that's going to come back later but it also has all these different metaphors for different things you know environmental issues again and it's how can you claim that this band has simple lyrics (laughs) honestly they might come across simply written but they're they're way way deeper than that and Again, we talked instrumentally, a huge shift, almost trance-like vocals to open the song, clean and choral and really brave for a metal band like this to even attempt. Metal is not the most forgiving genre and its fans don't like change um, mm. pretty much ever. Uh, you, you know, you, I, I used to frequent Bloodstock Open Air in, in my youth quite a lot and everyone there was still wearing denim cutoffs with patches you know it doesn't change it doesn't alter so to do stuff like this is just insanely brave and just you know they're going to do what they do and have fun um and they kind of you know drive the song for the first two minutes until that like killer riff comes in almost pursuit of vikings by amana marath i don't know if you know that song but really groove in kind of thing going on um, it's just groovy. The drumming is absolutely phenomenal. Again, every beat is perfect and just adds so much. Uh, it's a real standout. Um, they, they, the drums here almost actually feel like a riff to me in parts. Do you, do you know what I mean? They're like hundred percent. The, the, the yeah. guitars keep in the rhythm and the drums are providing all the kind of the riff uh, elements that you'd get. Um, it's just such a good way of building a song. I'm gonna stop talking now because I could literally talk about this forever and not stop. <laughs> And, you know, we're going to run on for a long time if you let me. <laughs> and, and It kind of goes back to what I was saying before about, like, the knowing when to take the spotlight and who's going to take the spotlight and kind of letting the drums shine through as a bit of a feature is, like, a kind of recurrent theme. Like, when they're not super locked in together, um, there's, there's always, like, they're, just the musicianship in general on this album is just, like, sublime. 
Um, and you know what I really enjoyed uh, looking at how they structured those instruments and used them, right? You know, so like you were saying, you start off with those uh, with those kind of choral uh, vocals, and then it's like every couple of bars to begin with at the start of the song, right? You're adding in that extra layer: guitars join, bass join, drums join. We march along, and like, yeah it really gets going around that two minute mark. Um, and I, I really f- start to feel like, you know, hold on is the band issuing some friendly advice. Like you're about to abro- approach like a blind drop on a roller coaster or something. Um, yeah. You know, there, there's something about that little breakdown uh, that scratches a long dormant, almost vaguely metal core itch uh, lurking someone somewhere within me from a much darker time of my life uh but really you know this section is the sort of thing that i think of when i think of metal um heavy as fuck guitars thunder space gritty growling vocals with that one sort of group call moment on fight um yeah what sets this one apart for me is uh when we shift into that bridge section and everything pulls back a little bit again uh the riff changes up to something a little more i don't know maybe like a little more of a classic metal type vibe to it right and the vocals get a smattering of melody added into them um and yeah you know you it it sits back behind the guitars and then boom you're back into it the next minute in your face chaotic tearing shit up um this is one of my proper head banging tracks on this album i want to talk about that bridge a little bit more because did anybody else get master of puppets vibes yeah i i i got big feeling that they'd you know um spend some time listening to old metallica for this and it's it's not the cool thing in metal anymore to reference metallica as an influence but god damn is that song great there's no denying it and god damn is this song great um and i just got huge vibes of that kind of that melodic breakdown towards the end of that song here and that breakdown i definitely don't think this is a band that's like afraid to hide or they're afraid to show their influences mm. you've already mentioned the sepultura one earlier um Metallica now, there's another one coming up that I've mentioned to you already <laughs> outside of this. Um, but yeah, they're definitely like not ashamed of their influences, and nor should they be, really. No, no doubt. Um, yeah, Cam, you spoke to me earlier this week, um, and again today, actually, about wanting to see Gojira live, and Hold On was certainly a song that I think I would want to see live um, uh, 100%, as with many other on this record, many, many other... <laughs> Uh, right. So we move on to Newfound. Um, t- uh, you guys have spoken a little bit about the, the groovy nature that creeps into a lot of uh, tracks on this album. Um, the intro to Newfound is uh, probably one of the starker examples of this uh, for me, I think, uh, that I found, or at least the first time where I was like, yeah, no, I'm confident enough to write this down. Um yeah, Brad. What did you What did you think of Newfound? Well, speaking of influences, <laughs> um, <laughs> like straight away you get like a kind of Pantera vibe here. I think. Yeah. Um, just the guitar, the guitar sound, or the guitar tone, if nothing else, you've got, got that like that phasey sound coming up through it. Um, and it's kind of some more staples of Kajira, like the pitch shifting mixed in with chugs. Um. The kind of A section, the vocals and the guitar just lock in like perfectly together again. Another kind of example. Um, you've got some like slamming breakdowns throughout this. Amazing hook writing again, just kind of keeps coming through. Just back on musicianship though, a bit like there's never anything in this that seems like they're trying too hard or like they're trying to, like they're out to impress. Like, there's no like ridiculous solos. There's no like kind of overly complicated, overly technical things that kind of draw you out of it. Everything that is in there and is technical is there for a purpose. And um, it's nice to like, it's about the songs. <laughs> it's a metal album and it's like about the songs more than about like technical proficiency. Uh, it's obviously technical, technically proficient they are. Like, it's nice not to have that, like, kind of thrust in your face <laughs> constantly. 
it is super rare in that you you don't get many metal bands where you know the songwriting comes first i will actually say about this one it's not my favorite on the album and i i did a little mini cheer when i heard this for the first few couple of times because it's a chance for me not to fanboy it kind of feels like a leftover track from magma which isn't in itself a bad thing but i've heard magma before you know what i mean um there's some great melody on the chorus though like brad said the hook writing is unreal and there's that gorgeous like lead riff accentuating the melody underneath it as well again tight drumming the bass just for a metal album is so clear and driving you know the, the joke in metal is that you you turn jason Newster down and don't, don't have bass on the album right um it's just it's why this album sounds so big and why gajira sounds so big um the verses aren't bad per se i just found them a little bit repetitive um i, I kind of felt like maybe they wrote the chorus and knew that they had a special chorus and then had to write a song around those choruses um which is fine but considering how outstanding the rest of the songs have been so far it, it was a little flatter compared um not the best work but still really good um and, and then you get that that outro is real groovy as well it's just a little long but yeah it's sort of interesting isn't it you know it, i i think there's a few different styles kind of sewn together a little bit on this track um it was definitely something that i noticed and you know th this is around six minutes 30 long um i think this is the longest track on the album um uh and you get a little bit of a false end around that 4 30 mark where everything pulls back um and you're given the impression that you know like there's those gathering storm clouds encircling you uh ready to take you on to the next track but then it just picks up again out of nowhere i think that's probably that outro that you were talking about um uh, these types of things on tracks used to absolutely kill me off when I was a DJ. Um, Renegade 86 by Let Live is one of those tracks that I will never forget for having the most painful false um, ending on it that every time like the room just went silent for a second. I went, oh, fuck, I thought there was another minute of this to go. And then, oh, no, there it is. All right, it's kicking back in again. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about on this one though you know with, uh, and it's something that's prevalent across the entirety of the album um is uh the vocal production and the vocal work i i, I think it's stellar right you know on on newfound uh it's a great microcosm for it you know the vo the vocals at the start of the track are pretty much as visceral um i think is uh you're going to get on the entire album like the first two words long lost are delivered in a way that it sounds like his you know his, his lower jaw has been torn off completely right and he, he's uh um saying that but like you were saying earlier you know about trying something new it demonstrates a really fantastic range i think um throughout the entirety of this song and uh especially when you get to that melodics uh section which doesn't lose any of its grunt gristle and growl but um you know it's the backing vocals that really uh give everything that little bit of extra texture for me and, and lift it up to just be fantastic i think on this song and many others on this album yeah 100 percent. it's the kind of backing vocal that really makes you think about your own productions and the way that you you go about uh you know writing that kind of stuff i mean we had this conversation earlier today and i i felt the same thing listening to this because i was like okay well you know we did a good job but this is how pros do it kind of thing you know what i mean um is it's just absolutely incredible and it's it it's very funny um and i'm glad that well I, I think it's fun that we're having this conversation in public now but when you said to me i want to write more gojira like stuff the first thing i thought of was the backing vocals and everything like that it's like yeah that's the part that i want that's for sure that's for I sure i think my exact words are i want to go more aggressive on the next record like gojira meets gojira but <laughs> bang on bang on bang on and i still immediately thought of yeah the backing vocals from this that's a fair one. It's a fair one. Uh, Just in case anyone was unclear about whether you liked this album or not at this point. 
I have mixed feelings. It's you know, it's fine. It's no, it's no sweep it into space. <laughs> you missed that week, Brad. So that was yeah. probably a little lost on you. Yeah, I just know, I've, got a, I've got a thing for that. Yeah. <laughs> Should have just said yeah. I don't know, citizen or something, right? You know, there you go. To me, to me, this is like kind of a bass feature track. Um, like in the hooks, you've got the bit the bass is coming through some melodic lines. You've got like that kind of bridge part where. It's a bit of a role reversal there. Like the guitar part stays the same; it repeats, it repeats, it repeats every time the bass plays something different underneath it. Um, again, just another example of them like kind of sharing the spotlight a bit here, rather than like this is metal. This is all about guitar all the time. <laughs> I'm really glad that you have both mentioned this, right? Because you know, I I I picked up on the bass in a lot of places. It may not have come through in my notes so much. Um but uh yeah I, I was sitting there thinking I'm like this isn't like a hallmark of metal, is it? You like you don't normally It's a difficult one because it's not like traditional technical metal bass where you think of something like, I don't know, Necrophagus or something like that from way back in the day where the bass lines were absolutely insane. But they were basically someone shredding on bass. This is this is almost classic bass playing, you know, um, mm. sort of more classic rock bass playing, where the where the bass is an instrument in its own right. It's nothing crazy. It's not doing anything that most people, you know, most bass players couldn't play. But it, it's it's doing what bass should do, in my opinion, and that is absolutely serving the song um, at every point. And even when it is getting more melodic, like it does, as mentioned it's still always serving the song and not just shredding lead or being completely invisible, which is just, it's just so rare in metal, you almost never hear it. Either that or we just want to keep making Matt say the bass player's name. <laughs> Jean-Michel, I didn't even scroll up this time. Didn't even scroll up. What's his surname? Labadi? Yeah. Labadidi? Labadibidibi? <laughs> Um, that kind of sounds like a bass noise, right? <laughs> it makes sense. That's the easy way to remember it. Um, let's get away from that as quickly as possible and move on to fortitude. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, a bit of an interlude, um, moments change up the tempo and catch your breath. Uh, this is the moment that I was flagging up earlier. I really do envy anyone that comes to this album and hits this track entirely unaware of what comes next. Um, I had already heard the chant prior to this album's release, so I think the big payoff of this song is spoilt for me somewhat. Uh, this is exactly why I don't watch trailers for movies I know that I'm going to see. Uh, had both of you heard the chant before listening to this album i actually hadn't you... um it was one of the few singles that i hadn't um and and it wasn't until i hit the chant that yeah you're absolutely right uh you you made a mistake and i'm really confused as to why they released it as a single pre-album now because there's a huge shift in tonality that happens in fortitude and brad will correct me if i'm way off but i'm pretty sure that the second half of this album has a completely different guitar tuning to the first half of this album. It sounds a lot lower, a lot, lot sort of, uh, like, very low on the first half. And this is immediately, unfortunately, shifted up. Um, and obviously, you've got that kind of refrain, that vocal chanting thing that comes through that's kind of radio edited, um, you know, EQ'd to death and kind of sounds underground and underwater. Um, the weird drums and kind of the nice nice break and stuff like that but it is really that tonality shift that is what makes the chant such a strange thing to release as a single pre-album without having heard this first i don't know if it's necessarily like tons lower in the first half um it's one of those things that you you mentioned earlier you said heavy without being heavy it's like not an h string album you know it's not like it's not heavy because it's low it's heavy because what they're playing and like how it kind of suits the song um but there is definitely a bit of a shift here in like the kind of voicings they're using um stuff tends to be a bit higher up the neck i think if nothing else um but yeah i also hadn't heard the chant before i heard this and i think at first kind of like cursory listen not kind of looking at it as i was listening to it i was I kind of thought this was just a really awesome intro yeah. <laughs> to the next song. Um, 
but I really love this. Like, it instantly gave me kind of chain gang vibes in a way. It's got like, like kind of somber lilt. It's got a bit of an ache to it, I think. Like, there's no like vocal, there's no harmony, but it's very lyrical still. And yeah, it definitely kind of provoked a bit of an emotional response for me. It did feel like something really deep. Um, and obviously the payoff is coming next. I I cannot tell you how much I envy both of you. I, I really, 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 really envy you having that moment because, you know, I heard it. I'm like, oh, cool, we're on to the chant. I'm like, wait, no, this isn't the chant. This is a two-minute song before it. Uh, okay. So, Matt, it will kill you even more to know that my first, my the very first line of my notes for the chant is, when this comes in from the back end of Fortitude, it is so satisfying. <laughs> well... <laughs> So yeah. satisfying. Yeah, and and you know it still is, and we'll we'll get into this here. I mean, so uh, I want to just return to the band's uh, PR for this album very quickly as we move on to the champ, which, as I say, was the final single, or at the very least, it got some uh, radio play prior to uh, the album's release. Uh, but I thought this was really fun. Um, so uh, the album long call to action comes to a head with the chant. A slow burning track singled out by Mario as Gojira's most melodic material to date. Where past anthems were driven by nuanced dynamics and technical guitar arrangements, the chant is self described is a self described healing ritual, emanating primordial warmth, culminating in a harmony stacked chorus that bridges the gap between ancient hymns and contemporary rock. Consider Joe's two-word rallying cry in the refrain, get strong as fortitude's mantra. Um, yeah, so, you know, barring your first line, which uh, you have just told me there, uh, talk to me, Kim. So I've sort of mentioned that there's this huge sonic shift, and my, my, my feeling of what fortitude was there for is kind of confirmed by the chant. Um, I, I, I really do feel like this is a, a, a definite huge shift in tone, in what we're going to get in the second half of the album. Um, this is more like akin to downtuned alt rock at this point. You know, it's 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 not really metal at this point. Um, and again, I've mentioned I love how brave this band is because metal fans are not forgiving. And it just absolutely prove it here again. Um, with that, Primordial is the best way to describe it. I know what Brad was describing for, before. Um, it is. It's almost like a roar. It's almost like back to our roots again you're talking about the lyrical theme themes on born for one thing um and you, you're kind of looking at the same sort of things from a different angle without any lyrics here which is insane um make no mistake about it gajira have the potential to be one of the all-time giant metal bands uh metallica big they have that crossover potential they really do because you know the clean vocals, the production, and all of this, the songwriting, everything just absolutely proves that they've got the hooks in them. They've got they've got this in them. Uh, not a lot of bands can can write this song. They really they just can't. Some big bold statements you're making there. I'm trying not to, but it's so hard. This is the, I, I I I defy anyone to disagree with it. Really. There's, Go on, Brad. Disagree with them. Do it. There's stuff going on. Here. I was gonna say, like, I don't. Again, it does go back to like, like kind of primordial thing. And that's a good way of summing it up. But I think there's something just distinctly human about it. And like I said, with Fortitude, it kind of gave me that vibe of like the chain gang. You could kind of hear the pain in it and like the kind of raw emotion. And that's like backed up when you drop into the chant with those vocals again. It's like it's aching. And I don't think. I mean, prove me wrong, but I think everyone could listen to that and get something from it. I don't think there's anyone that could listen to that and not get anything from it whatsoever. Um, my first note <laughs> was just wow <laughs> on this whole track. Um, but yeah, like you said, with the, the kind of down tune, like alt rock thing, it does kind of go that way a bit. Um, awesome fuzz tone, like subtle but really nice um this song just like kind of grooves along nicely it's like got a nice shuffly feel to it um and yeah production <laughs> again throughout it's just immaculate 
Um, but it's mostly for me, it's about that kind of like those backing vocals, that like initial hook that just really hit me. So, you know, you've, you've touched on it a little bit, I think by, you know, both of you mentioning how Fortitude blended into the chain. Um, I, uh, sorry, the chant, excuse me. Yeah. Not the Fleetwood Mac song. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about Brad's chain gang comment, right? Um, I was going to say, that's definitely got crossover industry potential. (laughs) (laughs) You can see the McLaren hat over there. So yeah, uh, you're definitely right. Um, Yeah, I've done a complete uh, about turn on this track uh, from the start of this process to the end. Um, if, If I'm being totally honest, when I heard this spun as the rockest record, a couple of weeks ago um it was my first big uh-oh moment uh in the run-up to this album um it initially didn't gel with me at all um and i think i can mostly put that down to being that you know this song as you've both alluded to already is so different from the other singles that you'd heard another world uh born for one thing um and you know it's as that statement says as you both said it's a more ritualistic type of song. It isn't balls to the walls. Um, But Fortitude does an incredible job of setting this up, not just by tipping the melody, but acting as that buffer to slow everything down up until that point. And yeah, with each passing listen, um, uh, I fell more and more in love with this song. That melody, you've both spoken about it. It's one of those you know, handful of special ones that you come across in your life that just starts permeating through into my dreams at night. I, I've been sitting there falling asleep and just having, uh, you know, just going through my head. Um, you know, I may be making it sound, you know, we may have been making it sound like an outlier on this album too, but there's still a lot of elements that we've had up until now. There's that line, uh, wake up to the sound of doom. It sounds like it's delivered with the most venom of maybe any line on the record, but I, I think it's really just because it's placed uh, within some less aggressive music around it, right? I just want to go back to one thing you said very quickly um, about how you heard this as a single and you didn't feel it, and now you've heard it in context and it's become one of your favorites. This is how important album is as a format, because you're right, as a standalone single, I don't think this makes sense, but everything you've gone through, all the lyrical themes you've gone through, fortitude you've gone through to get to this point, makes it hit that bit harder. Um, and Gajira, uh, not alone, but you know, one of the very strong bands out there proving that the album still has a place in 2021. And I'm here for it because that format should never die. It's how music should be listened to, in my opinion. Um, you, you would never, ever get this kind of emotional resonance or feeling or impact that any of us have had by hearing this thrown into the middle of the playlist. And, and my first time hearing this was on record as well. And, you know, yes. I've, I've subsequently listened to it on the go um, via, you know, different methods. Um, and it's not the same. <laughs> hearing this on record for, like, for the first time was, was a special, special moment. It really was. It's pretty kick-ass bombing down the motorway at 70 miles per hour having this on. Um, I had that yesterday. It's very rare that I get on a motorway these days. It's still pretty kick-ass there. But, you know, on on your substantive point, um, I I think you're absolutely right. You know, this is the perfect poster child for, um, you know, the importance of an album. Because I've gone from this being something like, oh, this album may not be everything that I expect it to be, hearing it out of context, to now, like, you know, hands down, I, I, I'm happy to say this is like my favorite track on the album. And and a lot of that for all of my disappointment about not having that big reveal moment um, is down to that dynamic shift uh, that's offered up by Fortitude. No doubt, no doubt. Again, it's a contrast thing, isn't it? And there's a lot of build and then 
this comes kind of right when you need it, I think. Um, just maybe not necessarily one you're going to hear at Metal Night at your local dive bar, but, you know, in the format of the album, it really works. Do, do you know the other thing I'll say is that the, this is another one where it proves that you need to give music time, that you can't just listen to a track for a minute and a half and get everything thing that you need to from it I mean, and you know we've been going through this a bit lately because uh, a blog will listen to your track for a minute and a half and say nah sorry sort of thing and just outright reject it my first couple of listens to this song um i i'd initially written down maybe it's a minute or two too long because it is quite a long song and it is quite repetitive um my later listens to this song i am just in such a trance like state from you know from it that it, it, it's it's just incredible it's just there's no flaws in this song it's a perfect song it really is so i'm fanboying again <laughs> again making some big statements big statements but i think um you know from everything we have said um i i think a lot of those are backed up uh for sure um right so uh moving on to uh sphinx uh we've had Kind of our, our little bit of a di- dynamic shift, right? And we've had everything slow down a little bit. Um, but you kick back up a gear again uh, with you kick back up a gear again with Sphinx. Um, who can talk me through this track? Anybody feeling it? I'll go through. Um, we're kind of going around the continents. Anyway. Sorry, but I was just jumping in there. Uh, yeah, we're kind of going around the continents a bit here. We've we've had South America, now we're doing Africa. Um, the, the first thing I've got to say is just those pick scrapes are absolutely nasty. And just they're like, oh, they're so good. <laughs> they're, the, they're the kind of thing you hear on an album. And, I, and Matt, I don't know if you'll, you'll feel me so much on this one, but I know Brad definitely will. That you'll hear that on a record and your first thought is like, damn, where's my guitar? <laughs> You're like, I need to grab my guitar right now <laughs> because I've got to, I've got to like try and emulate that in some, some way. Um, I've just turned around and looked at the one I've got in the corner there. It's got two strings on it. Is that going to do me any good? You can pick scrape on that, I guess. Yeah, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just such a groovy track, and I love the kind of um, altered use of the intro riff for the chorus as well. There's a slight like difference in that kind of thing. It's just, again, dynamically, this band is so, so good. Um, it's from the drums, like Brad's already said, when to play, when not to play. Um, every symbol here in that chorus is like, absolutely perfect for crafting space. Um, it is, it, it is, it's almost kind of weird how perfect it is. Um, I, you can tell this wasn't just a thrown together kind of thing. This was carefully thought about. Every single hit, every single beat on this album was thought about. Uh, just an absolute masterclass. <laughs> Uh, you, you break down with that kind of similar feeling riff, but it's all expanded, that really tight double kick, uh, just all round great song. And again, lyrically, you've got this theme of the rise and fall of humans, and this time told from the point of view of something that's human constructed, like the Sphinx, which is really interesting. You know, you've got carved in like, sorry, carved in like stone. That's all. That's all there is facing the line become one. You're kind of talking about how many civilizations these things that have lasted thousands of years have seen come and go and they're still here and they're human constructed it's like a different kind of spin on the amazonia theme which is why i kind of thought that the continents were important to this because you know uh, obviously before you've got the amazon and that's going to be here long after we are uh, despite the destruction and kind of impact we're having on it and possibly things like sphinx will be as well are they human constructions though you're full of the bold statements tonight. I'm not saying it's aliens. <laughs> but aliens. And then we got a thumbnail. Millie draws a lot. Uh, I, I know you're out there. You handle all of our graphics and everything. I know you got some strong opinions on Sphinxes and the pyramids. But Brad, let's hear your strong feelings on uh, Sphinx. I just don't want to reveal our um, upcoming video series <laughs> that may throw further light onto this. First contact, hi. <laughs> Don't talk about it on the internet, bro, because once it's out there, it's not your idea anymore. <laughs> I've got the IP locked on that a long time ago. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. Go ahead. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Nasty, The Rakes. Um, also, my 
descriptive term there, nasty, you can't get around it. Um, while it's kind of, you're still in that kind of slow down kind of mood, but the tonality is like back to a kind of darker shift. Um, you've got some kind of like harmonic minor sounding stuff coming through, um, kind of fits with the subject material here. Um, and like you were saying, with like kind of a theme throughout this album, you've got like a lot of proggy bits where you do get, you said the intro comes back and it's a variation, and you do get a lot of that throughout this album, like subtle kind of variations coming back, like just enough to keep interest, but it's a very prog kind of approach. Um, yeah, I mean, I couldn't help feel a bit disappointed after the chant before, like I feel like this kind of didn't really build necessarily on that the way I'd like it to. I think maybe this would be better situated maybe after the next song. Um, that's really my only criticism though, like parts are all good, musicianship is all excellent again. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, you know, my engagement on Sphinx, I think on multiple listens would dip a tad um i still think it's a really great track um and you know once again you're showing off just how technically gifted the band are you, you both mentioned uh the pig scraping um but you know for me from kind of a non-technical musician standpoint right you know i i would describe it as almost physics defying at points um and you know any spot where you think that naturally there should be a little hitch or something like that it, it just never comes um it's so seamless so so seamless uh vocals are on fucking point um cacophony of sound enveloping everything left and right so rich so full um and I really liked actually as well the, the sort of the relatively understated solos that sit atop the second half of the track. Um, it, they steal none of the focus, uh, but just add to those layers of texture, which, you know, we've spoken about so many times already. Um, you know, like I say, not one of my favorites. I, I think following on from the chant is a tough thing to do. Um, but, you know, still absolutely getting the sense throughout this that uh, this is a band that are right at the top of their game. So, uh, moving on to Into the Storm. Uh, now, that has got a really interesting opening, I think, right? Uh, you've got the drums going hell for leather behind a bit of musical fog clanging symbol that seems to mimic like the bell on an old steam train and then that fog disappears and you feel like you've literally been run over by a train pretty quickly um cam did you have a similar experience i sent out a tweet earlier today um and luckily no one follows me on twitter so it's not spoiling anyone anything for anyone uh, the, basically, it was along the lines of, you know an album's a masterpiece when the only criticism that you can find for it is that there's a little bit too much ride bell in one of the songs. <laughs> I, I found that ride quite jarring at times. It's a little bit too much of it, and it's the only point of criticism I can pretty much come up with through the end, a whole drumming on this album. And it's really just a choice, and some people will like it, some will react that way, and I just didn't quite like it as much. I'm just um, going to jump in before you go too much further into this because I'm with Matt. Like I'm totally with Matt on this. You said it sounded like an old steam train. I got like to me it kind of reminded me of like a level crossing, you know, when like the train's coming and the bell's going and it's like do not fucking get onto the track and it kind of had that like vibe of like imposing kind of doom to me. Mm. I think that was like a, me and Matt have both kind of picked up on the train element. I don't know what that says about us as people, but. <laughs> You know, um, there has been a lot of talk of model trains lately. This um, is true, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I did want a hobby. Shout out to Dreadlocks, <laughs> well, who's got the model train hookup, so. Uh, <laughs> um, yo! <laughs> yeah, no, just interesting, but that's the exact vibe I got, and I felt like it kind of added to a sense of, like, 
impending doom, especially with like the frantic kind of guitar parts going on behind it as well. Yeah, I'll let you carry on now. It's quite, it's quite a strange thing, isn't it? Because we've all had quite different reactions to one thing. And it's, it's just, as much as I didn't like it, it's what this band is so good at in, in a lot of ways, is they'll have one thing from one song, this one ride bell. And how much talking point can you get out of a single ride bell? Apparently a lot, uh, which is which is pretty insane, really. It's quite a stop-start intro, so I kind of get what you mean, but I was a little bit distracted by the why is that happening so much, and I, I never really got the train thing, but maybe now I'll never be able to want to hear trains when I listen to this album. Yeah. Just before... The way it's kind of like, it's, it's, syncopated, it's syncopated as well, like you've got like the drums, are, like you said, they're going hell for leather, and that ride bout is kind of constant, but it's syncopated, it's not like on the beat every time, it's like... Yeah, some syncopation going on there. I definitely think it's a deliberate effect that they were going for at this part. Just before we move on from the train, uh, Dreadlocks has chimed in in the chat, Cam. I've got good news. I've got bad news. Which one do you want first? Uh, go with the bad news. Bad news. You've missed the boat. Shop's closed. I knew that. Good news. <laughs> it's now a five, guys. That's, that's bad news for me, man. Oh, no, free peanuts, you know, that's so good. <laughs> you did enjoy those peanuts. You did enjoy that's those true, peanuts. Man. It's like whenever you made me go to Five Guys, it's just I just sit there eating peanuts because there's nothing else I can eat. Do love a Five Guys. Closest thing that you can get to Culver's in the UK. Uh, still not all the way there. Um, question for you guys. Would it be a metal album without a growling go uh, shout after a minute of build as the track's about to kick off? Uh, I didn't even notice it. I'm not gonna lie. I think I was just stuck on why is there so much ride bell in this song. Um, yeah, I I don't think I actually heard that. There's, 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 I think this is this is the one we were sort of talking about before stream. There's there's bleed levels, uh, bleed by my sugar levels of grooving going on here. Um, just with an incredible melody over the top, which is not something I get from my sugar at all. I and mean, it's a good riff, but. Um, this just adds so much more for me, <laughs> like to that kind of aspect of it. It was, it was really, really cool. Yeah, it's definite the sugar riff again. Not being afraid to kind of hide, not being afraid to show some influence there. Um, amazingly, somehow it still sounds almost exactly as heavy, even though <laughs> I think this is in drop D. I think I don't think it gets any lower than that. And it's obviously the sugar's like eight strings, so <laughs> obviously some attitude being applied to it here. But yeah, I I also like the way like it doesn't overstay its welcome with like the kind of the technicality or the like strange rhythm when the vocals come in when you're into that kind of versy section. They're like, all right, stop fucking around. Okay, <laughs> we'll just play like a kind of normal riff now and let the vocals shine through a bit. Well, that's why I think it hits so hard for me in a way that I, I'm not, I'm not going to go out there and sound like I don't like my sugar, but that song never really got me in the way it seemed to get a lot of, especially guitar players, especially drummers and a lot of metal fans, because it is a really good rhythm, but it just goes on for three minutes and there's not much melody alongside it. Whereas this is just, just got incredible melody um, and incredible songwriting and they, they stop playing that riff after so long, so which is really nice. That's great. Um, yeah, as you both alluded to, really intense track. Um, I, I, I think you could swear sometimes that flames are about to burst out of something um, at some point, whether it's on their end, whether it's in your headphones, speakers, whatever. Um, but that melodic section offering that light relief um, uh, where it bursts into melody, incredibly effectively done. Um, and probably amongst one of the standout moments on the album for me. Um, it's summed up so perfectly, I think, by one of the lines of vocals where it says, you know, found the bottom begging for air. It's so accurate because you are just under such intense pressure with that riff and then you get the release. Um, very nice. Uh, we spoke about them being proph prophetic with, I mean, th this was written pre-George pre Floyd um, and sort of that sort of stuff and I, I almost had to do a double take when I was reading the lyrics of this as to whether it was about that or not mm. um, which is which is quite incredible when you think about it um, how much they've kind of captured that feeling without that event having taken place 
um, when when this was sort of due for release. Um, there's the anthemic cry in the chorus as well. If you're awake now, put your fist in the air. Yes. Um, so it's almost kind of like what happened before, what happened after, and everything, which is insane. Because again, that event had not happened when this song was written, and it, I could have sworn the first couple of times it was about that. This song could have been cheesy. I've heard a lot of bands do this kind of thing and that kind of chorus, that kind of anthemic call to action. Um, let's riot, but not riot kind of thing and make it super cheesy. But it's the, the vocals are pulled back in a way that you have to go searching for that meaning. And it, it just, it, it's, a, it's a real lesson in not pushing your message into people's faces. Let it, let them come to the message kind of thing um, in, in order to make it hit that much harder when it does it's it's about backing your shit up as well right um and you know we've already talked about that gojira do that with what they do outside of the recording studio what they do you know uh in terms of releasing their music and the way they talk about things as well you know one of the only other bands and you know there, there's a few of them out there but one of the only other ones that i think of in that regard as well is like into shikari right you know where so much of their music is about rising up etc solidarity you know is a example of a track that could sound quite cheesy uh written by another band that doesn't take such a prominent role within activism and you know do a lot away from the recording studio as well so you know there, there there's an element i think of that at play there um that line uh stood out to me um as well for sure um i i i think it's uh really interesting though um uh the sort of prophetic nature um that you point out there not something that i picked up on um very good um yeah you know uh, i think one last thing that i wanted to mention here as well is you know this we, we're dealing with a lot of tracks on this album that are longer than we have been used to covering in the last few weeks um, but I think, uh, Into the Storm stands out as an example of something that is quite common for some of these longer songs and that, yes, it's five minutes long. It doesn't feel like five minutes when you're listening to it, right? It's like, I'm getting to like the minute mark tops. Um, and that, that's what it feels like. It's past at that point, but it's like, you get to the end of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> it's another kind of like a proggy, like a progressive kind of thing coming through where it's like there's enough repetition so that you kind of know where you are but there's enough variation so that like nothing ever gets stale there's not like one time where i think okay i've heard enough of this riff now i'm gonna please hear another one it just doesn't happen during this album because like even though things come back and they're repeated it's never the same twice never exactly the same twice anyway um I think in avoiding that kind of cheesy anthemic stuff, there's enough contrast here as well. You've got that like urgency built up by Cameron's favorite symbol. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's not like if it was that kind of anthemic chorus kind of vibe the whole way through, I think it would sound cheesy, but you've got so many other things going on that like kind of builds to that. And that is the release that you kind of need in this track. Um, but it's not all about that. So, uh, yeah, just very quickly to say, Dreadlocks, thanks for looking out for us and letting us know um, uh, some of the dangers of five guys. Um, I'm going to turn a blind eye to that, uh, however. Um, Let the I, man speak. As I often do when it comes to food, I'm going to turn a blind eye and go, no, I like it. It tastes nice. Um, uh, right. And, uh, and with Let that... the man speak. <laughs> uh i think with that we'll move on to the trials uh brad do you want to kick us off here sure well i had to find my mute button but um <laughs> i'm with it now um this is kind of a nice little refrain um it's a bit understated um still you've got like some lovely groove going on i kind of got some like vibes of different artists it's not like massively in your face but i kind of got some like animals as leaders vibes again though it's kind of like i think it's the second riff i see i saw you pull that face but the second <laughs> riff some, something in me just went like i fucking know that from somewhere and it just kind of pulled me back to that um but again this could almost be like another down-tuned alt-rock kind of thing as well um 
you the don't the feel like I that face, Brad, just quickly is because I wrote down that this is almost a Pojam melody, <laughs> and I couldn't think of two more different bands and animals as leaders of Pojam. Can I, I can I groove. throw something? I think, it, I think it's the groove. I think it, you've got like a three note pattern. You've got like you're in four four quite clearly. The drums are like pushing that. You've got that three note pattern that kind of repeats. So every time that comes back around, it's not necessarily landing on the same beat every time. So like it'll be on the one, and then the next time it comes back around, it'll be on the two, etc. So it's kind of playing with the meter a bit. Um, it was more just the feel. It was just like it just really kind of reminded me of one Animals as Leader song, and I couldn't find it when I went back to it. But maybe it was just like transporting me back to a time when you know I had a lot of friends into Gojira, and that was probably about 2012. <laughs> and so that kind of gives you bit of an image of where my head was at at that point but yeah so just to throw another um completely different uh band uh onto uh this discussion here um i got i i think this was mostly from the vocals did anybody pick up any sabbath or maybe more accurately ozzy um vibes in places on this track so I, I like I said to me, it, not in tonality or like the way it was delivered, but the the kind of um, not quite metal, not quite alt rock thing that they had going on. It just is almost a Pearl Jam style vocal melody for me in the way mm. it it moved, um, and you know, just not with tone, but just, there was something about it that just gave me Eddie Vedder vibes, and I can't really explain why. It's a really intangible feeling. Um, but it, it was definitely there for me, which is which is why I was like, oh, Brad got animals and leaders. What's going on? <laughs> like, am I that far off? Uh, because you know, Brad is the undeniable best ear of the group when it comes to <laughs> like hearing stuff like that. Um, you know, um, it, it's a really odd song. You know, all round. Um, I'm not sure it's the biggest payoff on the album. Um, the, the the riff kind of loses a little bit of its tightness because of the kind of fuzzy tone for me. Um, I didn't I didn't feel like it was the tightest they were playing on the album. It's a nice change of pace though. Um, it was was slower again after a couple more crazy songs speed wise. Um, maybe it was no needed. I don't think filler's fair for this song, but it's as close to filler as we're going to get on this record. I think um, it's not the most interesting until. You get to a really, really groovy, almost psychedelic, almost out of nowhere um, outro. And I kind of wondered why that wasn't the focus of the song, because that is by far and away the best bit, and it's what really stops this song becoming filler for me. Um, Like you say, you know, I, uh, for me as well, filler, um, not a... Uh, not, not a fair way to describe this track. I, I did get the sense that everything was just spooling up a little bit um because it's the penultimate track um like you say just slow everything down a little bit after uh into the storm um uh getting ready for the closer and yeah you know you you probably did need that um but you know as with you there, there's not a great deal that i could point out as a uh, standout on this track sure you get a lot of the atmosphere that you come to accept uh, come to expect at this point um clean clear lots of good vocals uh but um yeah you know as you say that that outro is probably as close as you get to a standout moment for me um on this track see i'm gonna kind of slightly disagree i think with both of you here and please there's not do. like one please do. there's not like one riff there's not like one spectacular moment here that like makes me think oh this song is really amazing but again it's kind of another like kind of backs up what you're saying about the album formula cameron earlier like um it just fits so well where it is um as a standalone song i would say this would be more interesting to me than sphinx um i feel like sphinx is something you've kind of heard done a bit more before um and i think if you really wanted to get me interested into a Gajira album, I think this is the song you should play me because it was probably the one that would make me go, well, that wasn't really anything that I was expecting. So maybe I'll give the whole thing a listen. Um, I think it's just like a nice change of pace. I think it's a nice breakup. I think it's brave, like you said before. Um, 
it is kind of repetitive in a kind of droney like hypnotic way um but yeah i think i i would listen to this track on its own god such a fanboy brad <laughs> Right, stop playing that finger because you've been going on about this album all week. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good album. What can I say? No, I, I mean, when when I say filler, I mean this is as close as you get on this album for me, and it doesn't mean it's a bad song. Um, it just means that for me, what we've been offered up before, and I think it's kind of phrase we're in kind of post chant fatigue by this point. And that you're kind of just waiting for this album to end so you can go through it again and listen to another world in the chan. Um and it's it's maybe a bit of that as well. Um as a standalone song. Um I, I haven't actually listened to this one out of context, so I might want to do that at some point. Um and, and I feel like this this is one of those albums that has multiple layers that you'll listen to over multiple years and each song will hit differently, view at different points. It wasn't until I actually met Matt that the song Letterbomb on American Idiot became an absolute standout for me because, you know, you say it's uh, extolled its virtues constantly. And I was like, okay, I'll go back and listen to that. And wow, that's an incredible song. And and this could well have many, many moments like that over the years. I mean, this is a song that's on a Gajira album that could come on while you're falling asleep and not be like too jarring, you know? And it's. (laughs) calm there's like some really interesting rhythmical stuff going on but the way it kind of comes across is like it is calm it is like kind of serene and peaceful in a way um yeah and i think it's one of the more interesting ones on the album um yeah you know just to jump off something very quickly you said there brad not adding much but you know i i i will take this over sphinx um uh anytime um no doubt there uh right let's move ourselves on to the closer grind um as you mentioned brad the concept of grind or grinding is is nodded to uh and uh on hold on um and i think maybe one or two other places in the album as well um i just want to throw it back uh for a final time to a a quote from joe duplantier um uh, whatever this album has turned out to be for me right whether it was great or whether it was shit one thing that i have found out from uh us going through this process this week uh is that i really appreciate listening to him talk about his music um thoroughly engaging entirely honest you can tell that he is somebody talking about something that he is deeply passionate about um but is able to remain humble and relatable which is so rare uh when you think about how next level as a musician and writer he and the rest of gojira um is and are uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, the the quote here, um, I don't know if there's anything better in this world than playing a riff with a drummer, just grinding it. Lyric-wise, I'm talking about transcending ourselves and overcoming our problems. We have the power. We can change things. We can bend laws. We can break walls. But we also have our routines. Wake up, wash the dishes, go to work, make money. You have to surrender to that clockwork grind in order to find freedom. So do your dishes, motherfucker. You'll suffer less tomorrow. That's so weird. It's so weird because <laughs> I have not seen that interview. And one of the things I've written here is I absolutely love the lyrical focus of this song. Because as I get older, the more I start to think about these things myself, you know, the whole we're monkeys floating on a big space rock, right? Um, but we got to do the washing up kind of vibe, <laughs> uh, which is why that's so bizarre to me. I, I don't know if I'm subconsciously taking that in somewhere um, at some point. I feel like I must do because it's too freaky to write otherwise. Um, you know, surrender to the grind, obey, surrender to the grind, intersped with lyrics like forget about which reality is real, eternal quest to resolve our struggle with gravity. It's, it's just such an immaculate way to put this concept and feeling into a song. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost unreal how good that is because I, I feel like we all feel that way sometimes like why have I got to go to work you know with space monkey floating on rock blah 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 
like you know what mammal left the water so i have to pay taxes you know that kind of vibe and i feel like this song captures it in such a way that i just not ever heard anyone else ever do i i i read that quote right and having listened to this song i knew how much this was going to uh connect probably with all three of us certainly connects for me just how much it was going to connect for you though <laughs> considering some of our conversations um shout out Cherizula, thanks so much for the follow thanks for joining us tonight um yeah uh grind wonderful closer from start to finish um i i really think it brings a great album to a fantastic crescendo here um everything that we've had so far it's amped up a couple of notches but somehow perfectly slotted into like a five minute 30 package which considering what we have had for the last 10 tracks leading up to this point is such an impressive feat i actually have a slightly different feeling about this one as much as i love the lyrical themes about it and i loved the song i was slightly confused about its album positioning um I would have liked to have seen this and the chant swap places, personally, because I feel like if you'd ended on the chant, that would have been the closer. I don't think I'd be able to listen to another album again, because that would have just been absolutely perfect. <laughs> and I think like this was such a good song that you could have dropped it into that middle part and still had that that kind of change of pace that you really needed. Um, it's it's. It's, it's really anthemic, but it doesn't hit as much as the charm. Um, it's still a great melody and a groovy track overall, and I'm, I'm never going to be sad about more pick rakes because they, they're just probably the best at doing it. <laughs> like, they had so much practice at this point, they've, they've got that technique down. Um, yeah. How, but, how, many, how many picks do they burn through? Oh, <laughs> they must lose so many doing that. I, I, I feel sorry for their tech life. <laughs> the amount of picks they must have to carry. Probably um, the only band that isn't able to throw them out into the crowd afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Too I expensive, mean. man. Um, but yeah, the, the, the breakdown felt a little forced to me, actually, I'd say. Um, it's a little sudden. It doesn't build perfectly, and it felt maybe a little shoehorned in. Um, yeah, and I, I feel like the champ would have been a stronger closer, but all around it's still a great song. I think it's very hard to listen to anything after the chant <laughs> and like in this album and be like, yes, that was better than the chant. And I think that probably speaks more to the strength of the chant than to like the weaknesses of any other tracks. Um, this track does have quite a lot of outro, <laughs> I would say. Um, and it's quite clearly like closing out the album, and I think it does it in a quite a satisfying way. Um, you've spoken about routine a bit, and it does go back to their like their kind of staples, uh, you know, like some fast paced stuff, the pick scrapes, and then just all kind of does die down a bit. That like kind of it's almost like one of their anthemic riffs, but it's kind of a bit more understated. It's not necessarily like a massive, huge finish, but I think kind of when you're thinking thematically about the album and the stuff they've been speaking about i think it kind of fits with that vibe as well um more of a kind of like not going out with a bang but with a fizzle <laughs> kind of thing you know as, as much as i love the chant i'm sitting here struggling to remember exactly how it ends but i think brad that outro right there right that that that's what you would miss out on if you switched the positioning of those two tracks around um i, I thought it was an incredible way to send it out you know just so fitting that you've got those stripped back you know there's that super technical kind of guitar i mean at least to my ear super technical um guitar part uh that you've got that's uh, sort of closing everything out before it fades out to that you know a little more stripped back a little more simplistic one and and I, again i i thought that was a great way to just finish it out um we've had so much conversation about closers and wanting to see this big crescendo moment i think this shows how you can do a closer without having you know the end of it just being super loud you know horns everything going off i yeah, think it's much I think as much as like in this album there are those big anthemic moments and like those like kind of soaring calls to action as well. Um there's also kind of a lot of like raw emotion. I think these guys really feel like what they're writing about. They really like kind of take it quite deeply. Hence like the kind of action and like 
the actual doing stuff <laughs> that they do around it. So I think like to close this with a big soaring like epic anthemic thing would feel a bit out of place to me. Yeah, definitely. It has what I'd like to call a Lord of the Rings outro in that it's got a fade out into a fade out. <laughs> it should have ended at the logical closure point, but uh, it's it's all really minor gripes, honestly. Um, this is as close to a perfect album as you're ever going to hear, in my opinion. So there you go. Let's let's take this on to our sum up discussion um, in that case. Um, we've got a pretty good feeling, I think, at this point now about how you're feeling about this camp. So Brad, why don't I kick off with you? Oh yeah, I hated it. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> no, um, I think this is the first Gojira album I've ever actually really given the time of day. Um, and from like the kind of snippets I hear, I think I would probably be a little bit disappointed if I went back to some of their older stuff. Um, this is obviously a band with a huge amount of like proficiency and experience together as a band. Um, you can just hear it on every track, like every single track, the way it's kind of arranged, the way they play together as a band, the way there's no, like, from a technical side, they're not trying to prove anything at any point, like, never feels like they're showing off or being flashy. Everything serves the song, which in turn serves the album, and yeah, I think you summed it up pretty well, Cam, when you said, like, this is, if anything... Is going to prove to you that the album format isn't dead this will be that album um i'd tell you what let, let me just jump in here um so we can end on a, a properly positive note because you know I, i'm going to start off with the positive um i i was looking forward to this album in a big way um and it really didn't disappoint um I do think that this is an album that ends up in a lot of album of the year discussions for those who are that way inclined. Um, and as things stand for me, you know, my own personal thoughts about that, 100% in contention for that. Um, I would expect it to be knocked off its top of the perch in the coming months for me personally. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't argue with that assertion that Gojira are one of the best to do it at the moment. Um, I'm genuinely in awe of the composition of this record, the technical wizardry that is at play here, vocal performance, use of backing, you know, things that I've spoken about tonight. Um, I think it's so bloody strong. And again, lyric writing, so effective in places, does a stunning job of accessibly communicating important messages with a band that have built a solid and well-deserved reputation for doing that. But I've got a ceiling when it comes to this genre. Um, Fortitude is pressed right up against that ceiling to the point that there are probably even some cracks starting to appear and it places there are perhaps bits starting to seep through that ceiling as well um end of the day this album was always going to bump up against that for me it's it's stellar work absolute certified banger don't get me wrong about that one of the best metal albums that i've heard for a long 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 time and like you both said it goes beyond that at points and you know metal album without being heavy in places or you know a different way to be heavy than having nine fucking people on stage banging beer barrels or whatever, right? Um, it ends up in my rotation, no doubt. Um, falls short of my own pantheon in a way that I think it ends up in yours, Cam. Uh, this is an album I'll, I'll come back to for years and years and years to come now. I, I didn't think Kajiro were ever going to top Magma. When I heard Magma, I didn't think they were ever going to top Limp and Savage. This band just keeps outdoing themselves. They really do. And I, I, I don't like to, you know, it was, it was, it was me that kind of originally said I don't want to rate these albums because I hate that kind of thing. Um, ten out of ten. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give it a score. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that and go back on that. But like I said, it's as close to a perfect album as you're ever gonna hear. Um, this band really is one of the all-time greats. They're, you know, they deserve to be mentioned in the same breath as, you know, the likes of Zeppelin. Um, 
in in and others that kind of Sabbath in terms of greatest to ever do it. They 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 they're that good for me. Um, musicianship wise, absolutely phenomenal. But it's the the level of songwriting that they bring to a genre that isn't traditionally known for its songwriting that is absolutely incredible. And just how much emotional resonance and and melody they bring as well. There's, you know, you just mentioned Slipknot, a band known for bringing a lot of melody to metal, but they don't hit an emotional way that hmm. Kajira do for me. Um, it's, it's, it's just beyond impressive. They're, they're one of those bands that immediately makes me want to write music, but also makes me sad that I'm never, ever going to achieve this level of writing music, no matter how long I do it. Uh, you know, you, you, you are really talking about four of the greatest guys to ever do this. In my opinion, obviously, of course. So I think we didn't get the uh, we 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 didn't get the exact wording. So I'm going to go back to both of you here. Does this end up in your rotation? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it kind of has to because it already is. I already bought it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think so. I definitely think that it's going to be one to listen to again. Yeah, no, same here. Um, I'll doubtless listen to this record a lot more. And, you know, I think maybe the other way of, I, I've put a little bit of spin on this just to make sure that, you know, we, we've we've got a little bit of a balanced take knowing what was coming up after uh, my contribution. But just to put it another way, um, the pop punk and ska kid loves this album. Um, uh, so I think that <laughs> might tell you a lot about what it is. Just one other thing I'll say, Brad, if, if, if you don't think you're going to enjoy another Gajira album, I would seriously give Magma a consideration because there's a lot of emotional kind of themes that come across from that that are here as well. And a lot of the melody writing is there, particularly yeah. in a song like Stranded, um, which which has, you know, one of the best choruses I've ever heard of all time. Yeah, and well, more pick rakes, so. <laughs> well, more pick rakes. Magma, was what, Magma was, what, 2016? I think that was kind of a bit after I was in that kind of phase of being around, around or exposed to Gajira. So I think possibly it was back when they were more in their like kind of death metal phase. Um, so yeah, maybe I should maybe I should go back and listen to that and not just be totally ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, it's testament to them though because a lot of metal bands don't show that growth. They kind of rinse and repeat with their formula. Think of a band like Cannibal Corpse. I mean. God love them, but they've been doing the same thing for 30 years, you know? Every album is pretty much exactly the same. Um, and and Gajira are one of those rare bands that show natural kind of growth and progression in their songwriting style without kind of alienating their core fan base, which is just, again, another absolutely incredibly impressive feat. Well, fantastic. I, I, I think we can wrap up our discussion of Fortitude there. Um, I doubt that this is the last time this uh, album is going to be mentioned on uh, one of our streams going forward. Um, I'm sure it'll crop up again, but uh, I tell you what, why don't we look ahead to next week? Um, and I know we've had a lot of back and forth on this. Um, so I'm going to ask this question out loud and Cam, you laughing because I know, uh, what you're thinking. Are, are, are we all still happy with Van Weezer? No, but I know uh. that you're not going to let me get away from this. Uh, I would rather, much rather do the new Squid album that came out today. Uh, but I get the feeling that your heart is set on Van Weezer. Hey, look, you know, there's three of us here. Uh, so I've got my one vote. I'd cast that for Van Weezer. Uh, you're you're casting yours for the Squid record, which you know I've seen a few people uh, talking about here. Brad, I think you've got the casting vote here. What are you feeling? Well, having absolutely no idea what you're talking about <laughs> in either of these, I think I need to find some kind of. Um... Let me just describe the Van Weezer album to you very quickly, and let me it's... follow it up afterwards. <laughs> okay, go it's on. Weezer doing their take on Van Halen. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me wrong, it's cool. Like it, it, it's fun for a laugh. I'm just not sure I'm gonna be able to talk for an hour and a half about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you not hear the first single from that album? Did you not hear the second single from that album, man? There's so much there. It's so much fun. There's only so much rope you can get out of. Ah, uh, yes. 
Weezer are doing a Van Halen impression. <laughs> okay, I think there's only one fair way to um to do this. So Cameron, heads or tails? <laughs> I'll go heads. Tails for whales, baby, never fails. Has anyone it, got a coin? It's tails. Yeah, <laughs> boy! <laughs> Oh god, Brad, you don't know what you've just done to us. We're gonna have to talk about Van Weezer for an hour and a half next week. And I'm gonna struggle. Maybe it'll be the, the shortest ballpark stream today. <laughs> or maybe we'll get together Monday be like, boys, I really can't do this for an hour and a half and pivot to squid. But okay, Matt, we're doing Van Weezer. There you go. Boom. You've got that. <laughs> Boom. And I tell you what, I was talking about something's going to knock uh, Fortitude off the top perch. I think we're going to get it in the next week. Let's go. Let's go. Um, I think it's going to be... It, 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 say I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun either way. Just like the last few Weezer albums, uh, I think, have been... Um, interesting but you know well i mean you know okay computer i think was uh technically very good but anyway let's save this for next week let's save this for next week um and i think we are about at wrap-up time here uh if you've missed any of the discussion or want to hear it again we'll have a recorded version of this going up on our youtube channel on sunday uh, if you're watching that recorded version, then we'll be going live again next Friday at 8 p.m. GMT with another album review. If you want more Gojira, then head on over to their bank, uh, excuse me, to their website, gojiraband.com. And remember, every cent raised by Amazonia goes to help indigenous people in Brazil. Uh, if you want more ballpark music, then follow us on Twitch, subscribe to us, and hit the bell on YouTube, and check out our link tree that's at slash ballpark music UK, where you can find all of our socials. This is likely the last time we'll say this here, uh, but you can check out our debut album, Dead and Famous by Aqua Tofana, that came out today. That's on YouTube, that's on Spotify, all your streaming services. Uh, every listen genuinely does mean the world to us, just as it means the world to us that you joined us for this album discussion tonight. Cam, you enjoy it? Of course, it's the greatest one that's ever done it. <laughs> Brad, how about you? Have fun? Yeah, I did. I definitely did. Glad to have you back, man. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Stay safe.